Hi, I'm Susan Wingrove Reed. I am the education consultant for the Anchorage Symphony and also the principal keyboard player. Welcome to Words on Music about our November 4th gala concert that will just be a rip snorter from beginning to end in so many different ways. So let's talk through each of the pieces for a little bit of background information. I'm super excited about what will be an Alaska premiere of the first piece by Quinn Mason, who was a young African-American composer. He was born in 1996, so living composer. And um, he's a composer and a conductor. A D Detroit Symphony composer in residence in 2022. Um, he's won a lot of awards, written a lot of music for orchestra, and the piece we'll be playing as our premier piece on that concert coming up is Joyous Trilogy which won the first prize for the Metropolitan Youth Orchestra in New York in 2021 as an emerging composer. Quinn Mason studied with, and did tutorials with Libby Larson, a renowned American composer, and also conductor Marin Alsop, among many other people. So women have had a very influential role in his life in the music world. He said that his goal for this piece that we will be joyfully playing is that it's basically a mini concerto for orchestra that embodies happiness and cheerfulness. And, and it's accessible work that will put any listener in a good mood, is at least his hope. It's in three sections. The first is subtitled running. It's always moving and seemingly never waning energy. Then the second section, reflection, is a gentle and introspective meditation featuring a solo trombone. And the third section is renewal, picks the energy back up, but a little more spirited and zestful this time, full of dynamic and vibrant interplay between all of the sections of the orchestra. The piece is dedicated to Will White, who was a friend and mentor, one of the most joyous people I know, said Mr. Mason. He described him as one who makes waves wherever he goes. Now, Mason's works have been performed by the San Francisco Symphony, Minnesota Orchestra, Dallas, over a hundred orchestras. So this young composer is a, a person of note. He's also passionate about outreach. He said that he attended his first Young People's Concert at the age of 10, the Dallas Symphony, and it was a life-changing experience, which gives us all the more reason to be proud of what the Anchorage Symphony does in terms of our Young People's Concerts and our outreach every year. He was also an avid listener of the radio. And he said that the concert hall after that young people's experience became to him a very special place to be. Music is a form of conversation and a place to connect with people. So I hope you can join us to hear Joyous Trilogy. Next on our concert is a piece that I have been looking forward to hearing performed live ever since I first heard of its existence. It's a piano concerto by composer Florence Price, who is a great treasure and find for our orchestra and orchestras all over America and the world now. She is one of the most performed Black female composers in the world, and she is also now finally being acknowledged, not just for being a female and a person of color, but that she is one of America's finest composers of the 1930s and 40s eras. So Florence Price. And our relationship with Miss Price began with our maestro Randy Fleischer, who programmed one of her symphonies and our orchestra fell in love with the music and he became a huge advocate. And it's really lovely that Elizabeth is continuing to carry that baton and um, that we have now coordinated with a very fine pianist and scholar, highly respected for her interpretations of Price's works as our guest piano soloist. So super excited about this piece. We also, I wanted to point out, had done a project about Florence Price at the Beartooth Theater just before COVID and showed a documentary film about her life that had just come out and there were live performances of some of her music. So super happy to see Florence Price this next weekend. In early 20th century America, orchestral music was largely regarded as the province of dead white men, 
a field in which a living black woman had no apparent hope of gaining a foothold. This makes the career of Florence Price all the more unlikely and therefore even more remarkable. Price faced the unrelenting double challenge of racism and gender bias her entire life. Nevertheless, she persisted and earned a crucial place in American music history that is still in the process of being fully recognized and celebrated. Price composed over 300 works, including 100 remarkable songs. She gave her first piano recital at the age of four, she had been born in Arkansas, was raised there, a mixed race family, middle class, her dad a dentist, her mother a businesswoman. She went to the New England Conservatory of Music at the age of 15, taking composition lessons on the side with the director of the school and majoring in piano and organ. After she graduated in 1906, she taught at several colleges in Arkansas and Georgia and moved to Chicago in 1927 to escape escalating racial violence and growing segregation. Her Symphony No. 1, composed in 1932, was the first orchestral work by an American Black woman to be played by a major orchestra, the Chicago Symphony. She was in grad school uh, during this era and had become a divorced person and was the single mom to two daughters. She was well known from the 1930s until her death in 1953, but then her music seemed forgotten. Her legacy includes orchestra music, choral music, chamber music, piano, organ, those wonderful songs. And her style is very much in the late romantic period, infused with echoes of her time's popular music and her African-American heritage. She was a true pioneer in music and struggled to raise her family and pursue her passion for music. She taught while she was working on the side to compose. She collaborated with other artists. She wrote radio ad jingles to make money. Um, but one of the big events of her life that became a turning point, she became very close friends with the singer Marian Anderson. And in 1939, Florence Price's arrangement of My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord was performed by Anderson at the Lincoln Memorial at a concert that had been organized when Anderson was denied the right to perform because of the color of her skin in Constitution Hall. And it had been arranged then that the Lincoln Memorial performance would take place. And then it was also broadcast nationwide over the radio. So hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were introduced to Florence Price through Marian Anderson. She was also good friends with another composer on our concert on November 4th, William Grant Still, and there'll be more to share about that later. In 1951, she got a commission by Sir John Barbaroli in England, but had to cancel her visit for the premiere due to going into the hospital. She also then was acknowledged to receive a wonderful international award in Paris in 1953, and she had dreamed all of her life to travel about traveling to Europe, but also had to cancel due to illness, and she died a month later. How I wish she could know now that she is being recognized as one of America's finest composers, certainly of the eras I mentioned, but now her reputation just keeps growing. And um, now let's talk just a little bit about the piece that we're going to hear. She was encouraged to write a piano concerto by conductor Frederick Stock, who conducted her symphony when it was performed by the Chicago Symphony. She played the premiere performance a year after the premiere of that orchestral piece, so in 1933. And it was to great acclaim. The piece is in three sections, fast, slow, fast, like a concerto, just there are no breaks between the movements or the sections. The full score was thought to be lost by 1940, and it was reconstructed from multiple sources and then performed. And our soloist, Karen Walwyn, gave the first performance of the reconstructed work in 2011. In the year 2018, an original manuscript copy was discovered. There are various versions of the story. One of my favorites is that it was located at an auction that was happening in a Chicago auction house. But whatever the roots are, 
the original orchestration was found. And it's really amazing, as Elizabeth has described to our orchestra, that the reconstruction that had been done by scholars, et cetera, was very close to what the actual orchestration was when it finally, the score was finally discovered. So the three sections include a moderato, which has a brief orchestral introduction and a wonderful piano cadenza, and then a sweeping main idea with hints of spirituals, and it undergoes virtuosic and harmonically inventive dialogue between the solo and the orchestra. The middle adagio is poignant and lyrical, gorgeous in a call and response kind of style with the orchestra, reminiscent of sorrow songs from the slave traditions in um, pre-Civil War times. And the final section, the Allegretto, is based on the juba, a lively dance that she said she was inclined to always use a juba in any of her larger works because it was such an important and infectious and exultant, commonly known dance that predates the Civil War. So Florence Price's Piano Concerto, something to really look forward to and keep rediscovering in recordings and hopefully future performances all over the world. In the intermission, we will hear a wonderful short work by William Grant Still, whose nickname is the Dean of African American Composers. And he was the first black American to conduct a major orchestra in our country and the first to have a symphony performed by a major orchestra, and also the first to have an opera performed as a black composer. He grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where he eventually crossed paths with Florence Price. His mom taught high school English and his grandma taught him hymns and spirituals. His mom was a widow. And when William Grant still was 10 years old, she remarried. And he has recorded that his stepfather was incredibly nurturing and introduced him to opera on recordings and also to the theater, which then he went insanely gloriously into a music career himself. He studied the violin, the piano, oboe, and clarinet. He composed 200 works in his lifetime, including nine operas, five symphonies, and four ballets. He was a performer and arranger on Broadway and in jazz clubs, and he arranged um, an Artie Shaw uh, for Nessie, one of the best-selling records in, in many, many decades, was an arrangement by William Grant Still. His serenade for orchestra was a 1957 commission from the Great Falls High School Orchestra in Montana, a superb ensemble. It features folk song ideas and wonderful harmonies. It's in a neo-romantic style and is described by many critics as just exquisite. You will hear echoes of the Florence Price Piano Concerto in the middle section of this piece. And there are references to pop ballads, including um, tunes that you might be familiar with, like I Only Have Eyes For You and the pop song Earth Angel. And it ends with a rousing forte of ecstatic joy. It was originally intended to be a cello concerto proposed by Still's great friend in Los Angeles, the, the internationally famous cellist Gregor Piotrgorsky. But instead, after he worked with the score for a while, it became more of an orchestral setting, but features lush cello scoring within the orchestra. Looking forward to another exquisite gem, William Grant Still and the Dean of American Composers on our concert. The finale of our November 4th concert is a work musically by Aaron Copeland, but we also have to spend a minute or two talking about what an incredible tribute it is to the genius Martha Graham, who did the choreography, and it was um, her idea originally to do the ballet with Copeland. Copeland was a self-taught, basically, a musician from Brooklyn. He immersed himself in studying piano and theory, but instead of going to college, he went to Paris, and where he became the very favorite pupil of Nadia Boulanger, the most influential teacher of her time, who mentored many, many international composers in Paris in that era. He became enthused about modernism and an array of styles and voices. Copeland later credited media when back in the United States that enabled composers to transcend the concert hall. 
serious art that could and must pay attention to the public taste and effective emotional communication. He incorporates in just about every score he wrote, folk music, jazz, playful rhythms, intriguing harmonies, bold brass and percussion. People of a vastly different backgrounds can appreciate the music of Copeland on so many levels. Now, overcoming dissonance with a common purpose. For the creation of Appalachian Spring, we've talked a little bit about Aaron Copeland, but now let's talk a little bit about Martha Graham. Time Magazine named her as one of the 100 most important arts people of the 20th century. She revolutionized ballet. Her system of movement tension of contracted muscles released with the flow of the body was cutting edge. And by the way, Martha Graham came to Anchorage several times. In the 80s and early 90s, the Anchorage Concert Association presented a dance series and would bring up companies, ballet companies, modern dance, et cetera. And Martha Graham's company came at least twice, I, I attended twice, and she was with the company both times as an elegant, powerful woman in a flowing gold gown, I'll never forget at one of the performances, and stunning dancing. The original ballet, Appalachian Spring, was filmed in 1958 for public television. And Martha Graham, who was 62 years old at the time, danced the role of the young bride as she had done at the premiere in 1944 and in many performances since with riveting charisma, incredible performer. And a, and a fun note also is that she danced in the premiere and with her to-be husband, who's part of the plot line of the story, she was actually falling in love with the man, Eric Hawkins, who was the dancer, and they married after Appalachian Spring. And he became the first male dancer to join her previously all-female company. So October 30th, 1944, was a historic night for the arts in the United States at the Library of Congress, the first performance of Appalachian Spring. The original orchestration for the ballet was 13 instruments. It was a chamber ensemble, plus the dancing. Copeland was already beloved for his ballet music, Billy the Kid from 1938 and Rodeo, 1942. The collaboration with remarkable Martha Graham was already synonymous then with a new direction for modern dance as of 1944. Thornton Wilder's classic play, Our Town, which was premiered in 1938, inspired Graham with, as she referred to it, its gentle spirit and emotional heart. This is a legend of American living, was her concept. It is like the bone of structure, the inner frame that holds together a people. The storyline in the ballet ended up being set in rural Western Pennsylvania, an area of the country well known to Graham as she had grown up in Allegheny. She summed it up, Part and parcel of our lives is a moment in the Pennsylvania spring when there was a garden eastward of Eden. Spring was celebrated by a man and a woman building a house with joy and love and prayer, by a revivalist and his followers in their shouts of exultation, and by a pioneering woman with her dreams of the promised land. The music for Appalachian Spring established the Copeland American sound, wide open intervals, nostalgic melodies. The Shaker hymn that is featured in the score, Simple Gifts, had appeared in a book published in 1940. And the use of the tune in his score as the song and variations on Simple Gifts led to tremendous popularity. And many, many settings of the song have appeared uh, through in the ensuing years since. Simple Gifts appears halfway in the ballet with its variations. The end of World War II was coming when this, first, this piece was first performed. The tide was changing for the Allies. In 1945, a joyful America relieved at the end of the war also celebrated that Appalachian Spring won the Pulitzer Prize for Music. The sweet version that the Anchorage Symphony will be performing 
is 10 minutes shorter than the full length ballet. And another difference is that he scored it for full orchestra rather than just the chamber ensemble. The opening of Appalachian Spring is perhaps the most effective musical sunrise ever composed. Sleepy oscillations in the clarinet and other woodwinds murmur over wide open intervals that consonant and very clear seem to reach for the horizon. And the simple hymn-like melody gradually takes shape as a community comes awake. Along with the inspiration from folk music, the evocations of country fiddling, dancing, and singing can also be heard in the score, and a turn to a neoclassic simplicity of harmony and melody marks Copeland's commitment to reaching a broader public. However, the famous simple gifts variation, as common as this melody is to us now in music, was not a bid for familiarity by Copeland. He actually selected this somewhat obscure hymn for its association with dancing. And of some of the memorable words, when true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. The reference to dance. The tune is first introduced as a simple round in the strings, as if for a congregation, and then followed by the clarinet, an instrument that Copeland described as pure. In surely one of the great ironies in music, Peter Goodman, who is a respected annotator, said that a reserved, openly gay Jewish leftist from Brooklyn produced the sound that we all instantly identify with conservative values, vast landscapes, and bold pioneer spirit of the rugged American settlers. We look forward to having you join us November 4th for an absolutely extraordinary program. Quinn Mason, Florence Price, William Grant Still, and Aaron Copeland co in collaboration with Martha Graham. And I know that attending a live performance makes so much more sense to the human heart to experience live. So even though there are recordings available of all of these pieces, come hear your Anchor Symphony Orchestra pour their hearts into these scores with our music director, Elizabeth Schultz, for an unforgettable evening of music from the Americas. Mm -hmm.